Hello, welcome everyone to this course on Christian realism. <laughs> Hosted and taught by Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy. The uh, course is taught by Mark Livecki, our executive editor and resident Just War scholar in collaboration with Eric Patterson, who is not here this evening, but will be with us next Monday. So we appreciate all of you who are here physically and have benefited from the barbecue dinner. And we're appreciative of all of those who are watching online. This course will also be posted as a video later at Providence YouTube. All of you already have the uh, readings suggested to you. Also, I hope all of you will consider buying the new reader on Christian realism, co-edited by Eric Patterson and Robert Yalstra, if I'm pronouncing his name Yalstra. correctly. But Mark, thank you for being here to lead us onward and to explain all of reality through the prism of Christian realism. Excellent. All right, I, I can't now do all of reality because we just lost about eight minutes. So, so sorry, it's not my fault. Uh, I, w I was going to, but now, now I just can't. So, um, but I would love to have my notes come back, and they did. All right, so uh, just a little bit of a game plan. As Mark has said, Eric Patterson is not here. Um, so I'll, I'll be handling today, and then we'll both be here next week, unless by popular demand you tell me not to come back. <laughs> okay, so that's possible. My plan today is to go through five points of Christian realism. If you catch me on a different day, I have 11 points. Uh, Eric has eight. I'm just going to give you five again. It's not because of the truncated time, but I'm just going to give you five. Um, and I'll leave the introduction with that. Thank you for coming. Uh, before launching into it, sort of by way of introduction, um, Christian realism, as Mark has already alluded, is obviously preoccupied with the nature of reality and then Christian response to that reality. Uh, my own preoccupation with these types of questions uh, intersects with my own conversion to Christianity. I was a relatively happy atheist, uh, and then I started, started studying the Holocaust and was confronted with the fact that I didn't have categories to adjudicate between good and evil, right and wrong. Uh, I didn't have the categories to substantiate my hatred of Auschwitz. Right? When I shook my fist at Auschwitz and said, God damn this, I wanted to be saying something about Auschwitz, so something about objective reality, and not just about how I felt about what it was that I was saying. That wasn't interesting to me, uh, or at least sufficiently interesting. So that began a long sort of journey. OK, what is right? What is wrong? Where does it come from? Um, somebody gave me a Bible, snarkily said, hey, you ever seen one of these? You want to try reading it? Uh, so that was helpful. But he also gave me mere Christianity, right? And he said, look at the first chapter. Right and wrong is clues to the meaning of the universe. Does that sound familiar? And it did, and it was compelling. Um, this idea about uh, the Holocaust stayed with me. I, I finished college, maintained my, I was probably an agnostic at this point. You know, wasn't sufficiently convinced that I could say I was an atheist. But I wasn't committed to actually converting. I run overseas. I hadn't read Jonah. I didn't know you could es couldn't escape God by going overseas. <laughs> but I went overseas and I went to Slovakia, uh, formerly Czechoslovakia, and very quickly became a Christian. Uh, and then hooked into this study community, sort of fashioned after Labrie. Uh, and one of the things we would do is I would bring uh, young people up to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, which is in southwest Poland, which I hope you know is a former Nazi concentration camp. I realize not every generation now knows what Auschwitz was um, or what Auschwitz is, uh, but I would bring people up through Auschwitz. And I'm a young Christian, and one of the things that I would be confronted with is other Christians rightly being horrified by what they saw, but asking me, what can Christians do about such things? And I would say, well, like, what do you mean? And they would say, well, I mean, after all, we're pacifists. And I was sort of horrified, right, because I'm of Sicilian Irish extraction, right? The only way that I would have a pacifist bone in my body is if I ate Stanley Hauerwas. Like, that would be the only way, right? Do you know who Stanley Hauerwas is? Does that make, okay, good. Um, no offense to Stanley. And I, I, I don't think he would taste good because he's got like a potty mouth, right? And so it, it just wouldn't be good. I'm not predisposed toward pacifism. 
So I was horrified to discover that all my Christian friends thought we were supposed to be pacifists. So this launched me into a long sort of pers personal inquiry. Um, I ran into just war tradition, I ran into Christian realism, and I became confident that my sort of natural belligerence, however qualified and constrained it had to now be, um, had a place within Christian thought. Um, just to set the stage for that a little bit, uh, when I first got to Slovakia, I had the opportunity to go up to Auschwitz to participate. I'm trying to set it. And that's starting now. <laughs> All right, so I don't have my glasses on. Can you, oh, they're my glasses. Can you just make that timer go away and then just start the stopwatch? That'd be great. Now, everybody knows that I can't handle my own technology, but that's all right. All right. So I went up to the 50th anniversary of the liberation of the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp. And after the formal ceremonies were ended, they started reading the names of all of the lost over the loudspeaker. And they had committed to reading the names of all the lost over loudspeaker until they had read the entire list. All right. Now, this is something of a counterfactual. We don't have all the names of all of the lost. But if we did, it's estimated that 1.2 million souls were consumed in the gas chambers and crematoria at just that one camp, Auschwitz-Birkenau, 1.2 million names. And so my buddy and I, after the, the formal ceremonies were ended, we toured the camp. We were there for two or three hours. The names, of course, are still being read the entire time. We leave. We walked along the railroad tracks as far as we could toward town, the names receding in the distance the entire time. We found ourselves in a Polish pub, and over a beer, we decided, how long would that reading of names last? And so again, counterfactual. But if we had 1.2 million names, and if it takes one second to read each name, then that list of names would require 13.8 days to read entire. All right, so 13.8 days of an unending litany of names. And my Christian friends are telling me that Christians have nothing effective to do about this in this world. We can pray, and that's not nothing, right? Um, you know, we can work in, in, in soft power scenarios and, and do things to try to, you know, bring peace and reconciliation where we can do all that. All those things are great. Uh, but when it comes down to it and the wolves are circling, I was dissatisfied with this pacifist option. You know, does Christianity have anything to say to effectively stop 14 days of names or frankly 10 days or one day, right? Does it have anything to say about any of that? And I was terribly concerned, but because if it didn't have anything to say about these things, then it seemed to me in my, my newly converted state that my new faith had really nothing to say about real life. It was all about the afterlife and getting there and, and maybe doing some good now, but the amount of good that I could do seemed unhelpfully truncated. And this isn't a demand that Christians necessarily be effective, uh, but I found something lacking. Right? And so this started the whole launch, or this launched the whole sort of endeavor that culminates into the work I do today. Um, I wanted Christianity to be able to make a practical difference in this world, right? and not simply prepare me for the next. It's sort of like the, uh, the Johnny Cash song, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Do you know the song? <laughs> right? um, the gospel ain't gospel unless it is spread, but how can you spread it where you have your head? Right? Uh, I wanted to avoid that. I wanted Christianity to say something about now. Um, happily, scripture seemed uh, more clear-minded about this than my Christian friends. Um, I think from creation itself to God's establishment of human government, to the importance of the land of Israel, to God's demand for an accounting of blood and lives from human beings, uh, to the prophet's preoccupation with justice, the care of orphans and widows, to the incarnation, to the physical characteristics of heaven, Scripture seems very clear that matter matters, right? Matter is important. And so history and what happens within history also matters. That seemed important to me. All right. Discerning just what Christianity has to say to history continues to preoccupy me ever since that evening in the Polish pub. And there's a whole lot to say about all of this. Uh, but I think it can be distilled, at least tonight, into five points um, that form sort of a theological ground of Christian realist thinking about global politics, particularly with the, the international relations, the use of force, warfare, these sorts of things. So my five points are going to fall roughly under creation, 
fall, restoration, responsibility, and then church and future hope. All right, now to give these five points a framework, I'm going to read a prayer to you. And this prayer, I think you'll find it roughly familiar, has been variously attributed to Augustine. It wasn't Augustine. It's been attributed to Francis of Assisi. It wasn't Francis of Assisi. Mother Teresa, even Mother Goose. It wasn't any of them. This comes from Reinhold Niebuhr, who's sort of the patron saint, if we have patron saints, of Providence Magazine. And as I'll explain in a little while, it's a um, this sort of to sit in the shadow of Reinhold Niebuhr is a little bit uncomfortable for me in various ways, and I'll explain why. Um, but by and large, he is rightly considered sort of the father of modern Christian realism. And he wrote a prayer, and this is a, this is a compilation of several versions of this prayer. This is the compilation that I, I like best. But it goes something like this, and again, I think it'll be roughly familiar. Father, give us the grace to change with courage what must be altered. Serenity to accept what cannot be helped, and the wisdom to know the one from the other. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as we would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if we surrender to your will, so that we may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you in the next. That is, of course, known as the Serenity Prayer. Um, it was written in the early 1930s as American churches were beginning to grapple with the specter of Hitlerism and Japanese imperialism. And the prayer became kind of a, a conceptual panacea for what Niebuhr felt to be the pacifist sentiments and calls for non-intervention that were, were rising up in the mainline churches. Uh, Niebuhr, almost solo, pushed against this mainline uh, disposition to withdraw, uh, to be to be non-interventionist in the in the onset of World War II. Um, this verse supposedly was printed on cards and was to be handed out to men preparing for the invasion of Normandy. I don't know if it ever was, but uh, that was sort of the, the prayer's reception in a conflicted time. Now, like Niebuhr, if at times with decidedly different theological tenets, Providence Magazine also stands in this kind of current of Christian realism. And Christian realism, just to give it a working definition, is a way of thinking about the intersection of Christian faith, the world, and political life. It runs from its conceptual headwaters in Augustine, um, which comes out of the Hebraic and classical Greco-Roman patrimony, and through Christian expression, uh, starting with Ambrose, Augustine, up through Thomas Aquinas, Reinhold Niebuhr, you know, Nigel Bigger, Mark Levecki, even Matt Gobush over there, folks like us. Now Niebuhr's prayer helpfully lays bare the structural bones of Christian realism. So it's out of this prayer that I want to draw our, um, our points. Um, and I'm going to linger over some longer than others. But to make a start, I want to begin with uh, the very beginning. Uh, so creation, Father give us the grace, all right, and focusing on this idea of Father and the implications that that might have. So a summary statement. Humankind was made in the image of God to exercise dominion or providential care over creation. As vice regents, human beings have the responsibility to exercise the creative and discretionary freedom necessary to help maintain the conditions required for human flourishing and for created good. That's kind of the, the cultural mandate or the creation mandate. The Orison's opening line should immediately signal kind of both our divinely appointed station and set the terms for our own existence. So in, in acknowledging God as Father, we accept at once our status as sons and daughters of the triune God, but it's important to grasp what that entails, right? What's fatherhood in this sense mean? Uh, let's go back to Genesis 126. Then God says, said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the ground. So dominion over all the earth. Now it's important uh, to register that being, uh, the meaning of what being made in the image of God entails is found in this, in this mandate to exercise dominion. And dominion, although it sounds like it, is not the same thing as domination. Right? Those, are, those are different. Dominion, as I've already suggested, is providential care, stewardship. Right? It's grasping that we have a responsibility in history 
for the conditions of history, a nurturing kind of care. Um, there's a garden that we are to tend. Now further on in scripture, we see additional explanation of what it means to be made in the image of God. So in the, begin in the beginning of Christ's Sermon on the Mount, we find the Beatitudes. And the first seven of the Beatitudes appear to be character traits that roll one into the other until they, they congeal into something that is called a son of God. So blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be sons of God, right? And in, uh, in Semitic thought, this idea of sonship is really saying something. To be a son of something means that you bear the characteristics of the thing being signified. So peacemakers bear the characteristics of the creator God, all right? That's important. Um, we'll unpack some of that in a little bit, uh, but a parallel commonant is, is important. As I discuss the core commitments grounding our own work, but grounding Christian realism, I'll inevitably be brought into conversation uh, with Christian pacifism, uh, as I have I've already alluded to. Now, my commentary regarding Christian pacifism might leave you to believe that I don't think really highly of it, and that's only because I, I don't, okay? And so I'm gonna have some fairly strong things to say about it later. I mean, I always feel a bit like a punk because it seems on the surface to pick a fight with a pacifist is really kind of lame, um, but, but they can be mean, right? Stanley Hauerwas, everybody says, if you want a pacifist with you in a bar fight, he's your guy. So I, uh, I tread on dangerous ground. You're going to have to explain through Stanley Hauerwas. This is a young crowd. Well, some of them nodded that they knew him, but Stanley Hauerwas, a Methodist, right? Well, should I disabuse them of their happiness? Right? No. Stanley Hauerwas has an awful lot of really great things to say. I think when it comes to the use of force, he has less great things to say. Stanley Hauerwas is a noted, now retired, I believe, Methodist theologian, um, Duke University, um, big advocate of what he calls, and what I'll address a little bit later, uh, the Christian church is an alternative or peaceable kingdom as an alter alternative witness to the way the world goes. Um, and on the surface, that's a, that's a very tempting offer. I think we want alternative visions to the way the world is arranged, right? Um, but we'll get into Stanley Hauerwas's pacifism in a little bit. Um, there are some points of agreement. One of them is this, that the pacifists insist that of all the Beatitudes of Jesus that he illuminates or enumerates within the Sermon on the Mount, this call to be a peacemaker has a particular muscularity and offers a particularly clear articulation of the Christian vocation and political witness. Um, obviously, what we mean by peacemaker is going to bear out very differently. Um, the other Beatitudes point to attitudes that need to be cultivated. Right, um, Peacemaker also demands particularly concrete actions that emerge from this. All right, I'll get into more of that later. The Christian realist knows that the biblical concept of peace is hardly touched if we think that peace means simply something like the absence of external conflict or the presence of inner tranquility. Right, so it's about much more than just being nice to each other or wishing that one another be happy and trying to set the terms so that we can be happy. It's not that the Christian realist is uninterested in human happiness, but we understand human happiness to have a peripatetic connotation or an Aristotelian connotation. Um, happiness means eudaimonia, right? Human flourishing. And it turns out, like it or not, that human beings can only flourish under certain um, fairly concrete terms, right? The, the ecology in which particularly we can morally flourish is limited. And the Christian realist wants to know what that looks like. And one of the hints is that it's going to include responsibility for our neighbor and our neighbor's neighborhood. Okay, at its core, peace or shalom designates a state of wholeness, of harmony, completeness. So shalom points to the way things ought to be. It's that state, as my old PhD supervisor used to say, it's that state in which the lion can lie down with the lamb and you don't have to replace the lamb frequently. <laughs> All right. In the Old Testament, the prophets used shalom to convey the blessings for God's people associated with the coming of the Messiah. It was grounded in the presence of justice and order, which are conditions that are required for this human flourishing. Biblical peace is comprehensive welfare extending in every direction. You should already begin to sense that anything I say should not be 
um, carrying the assumption that we can achieve this now, right? Uh, we can achieve some of it. We can achieve approximations of it. So the Christian realist should always be a relatively discontented person, right? Um, and it would, it's an interesting question to ask, how does the Christian realist move through history carrying both the lament or the lamentation of what it means to live in a fractured world in which we can do, relatively speaking, limited good, while at the same time, like not committing to just suicide, right? So where's our hope come from, right? So how do you, how do you walk through the world with both lament and hope? And I think those two states, if they don't characterize our Christian walk, there's probably something off with our Christian walk. We should be defined by both lament and hope. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Bible, uh, shalom is translated as irene, or the manifestation of peace. Right? So Christians should be irenic. Now, one dominical mandate for Christ's followers, therefore, is to be irenic, not merely to be peaceful, but to be actually aimed at peace. So it's not enough for just me to have this inner tranquility that has to radiate out in concrete action. And on that, Hauerwas and I are in complete agreement, because it's not as if most pacifists do nothing Right? They, do, they do try to manifest this push toward peace. So on that, we're fellow travelers. Um, conceptually, Christians, uh, this might be helpful conceptually, Christians are called to be peacemakers, not merely peacekeepers. And that could be a very different thing. Now, we have to be careful, as I've already suggested. Uh, obviously, the lamb cannot, in fact, lie down with the lion today. And we shouldn't compel it to, right? unless we're on the lion's side. The fullness of shalom is out of reach. We must be careful not to try overly hard to bring shalom within reach. Um, history, I think, is a, a butcher's board of examples of what happens when human beings try to bring peace into the world now. Right? When we try to take what belongs in the eschaton and we try to collapse it into the present day, it usually doesn't go well. That said, a sober pursuit of peace uh, can yield real and valuable fruit. Human endeavors such as the US Constitution prove this. Right? Think about that document. The establishment of measures to ensure security and public safety promoted domestic tranquility is central to what this new order being created in the American Revolution was all about. Peace was to be the product of order and justice. And if, if, if you do a word search in this text later, you will hear order and you will hear justice over and over again. All right, without order and without justice, no other political good can long endure. Right? Not, pe not health, life, things like this. All right, that's enough on that for now. Again, to invoke my, uh, my old uh, PhD supervisor, Jean Elstein, of blessed memory, she asked uh, rhetorically, what kind of peace is it that the Christian peacemaker is aiming at? It can't be the fullness of shalom, we've already agreed. She says, we, we're after the quotidian kinds, the everyday kinds. And she phrased it like this. She said, mothers and fathers raising their children, men and women going to work, citizens of a great city making their way on streets and subways, ordinary people flying to California to visit their grandchildren or to transact business with colleagues, all of these actions are simple but profound goods made possible only by civic peace. They include the faithful attending their churches, synagogues, and mosques without fear, and citizens, men and women, young and old, black, brown, and white, lining up to vote on election day. And she wrote that shortly after the Twin Towers <clears throat> fell. That's what we're after. And again, if that's, if that's does it bring a fullness of content, contentment? It's because it, it shouldn't, but it's not nothing. All right. If shalom is aimed, is what is being aimed at when one aims at peace, the approximation of shalom, then the practical ramifications of Christian pav pacifism's version of peace, which, which declares it to be an, an absence of, of violence, uh, is a far cry from the peace that's intended on the Sermon on the Mount. There, remember, peacemakers look like God. Um, and you, you, you want now to go through an examination of what does it look like 
uh, for God to be a peacemaker? How does he bring about peace? You know, not just the, the red letter bits of scripture, but the, the entire testimony of scripture. What's that look like? <coughs> All right, on Golgotha and elsewhere, God's career in peacemaking makes plain that the establishment of right relationships or reconciliation between warring parties, uh, reconciliation between fallen people and their God, between fallen people and each other, all of this uh, is both, is, is the intended aim, but it's never easy. It's something that comes through struggle, confrontation, very often partisan engagement, we bring peace today when we enlist people in warfare against evil struggles. The circle of right relationships, that is peace, will often, in a crooked world, be relationships that pass through struggle and confrontation. So a peacemaker has to be somebody who's willing to enter into struggle in order to get to the other side. And I'll say a little bit more about what that looks like in a moment. The confrontation does not mean, as some hear it, to suggest the abdication of Christian love. I would say far from it. Um, confrontation and love are not binaries. They can collaborate. In fact, they must collaborate. And, and again, I think you can look at the cross to see how that is. D.A. Carson, a noted theologian, suggests if you want to see mercy as it barrels along throughout redemptive history, you just have to look at the cross. But if you want to see justice as it barrels along through redemptive history, you have to look at the cross. Right? So both mercy and justice are both there. Not in opposition, but in, in harmony. Um, both God's love and wrath are ratcheted up in this movement from the old covenant to the new. Right? Um, you want to see God's love, Carson says, again, look at the cross. You want to see God's wrath, look at the cross. Um, I think this is partly why the pacifists claim that the Christian ethic of love necessarily involves the rejection of violence is untenable. Um, it's Jesus, after all, who speaks more than anybody else about hell. Um, it's Jesus who shows anger at the temple desecration, at the devouring of widows, the abandonment of orphans, all the rest. It's not for nothing that in Psalm 2, we are cautioned to beware of the sun, lest he not become angry and we perish in the way, foreshadowing what, what Christ will look like. Nor that at the end of it all, it's the lamb that was slain, who returns as a heavenly warrior with a sword for striking down the nations that war against him. I think we have cause to believe that that's just not a colorful metaphor. All right. And then Christians, particularly evangelicals, tend to get themselves in a bind when they point to Jesus as a model for the moral life. It's not that he shouldn't be a model for the moral life. He should, but I think we get what that model means wrong. Um, I don't dispute the, presence, the principle itself. Um, you know, but you can ask, and, and this sounds like snark, but it's really not meant to be, what is exactly is it that we're supposed to follow when we invoke that we should follow Jesus as a more example? Is, is it acceptable, for instance, for Christians to marry? Jesus didn't. And that sounds like sort of a, a lunatic example. There are communities throughout history who have thought, following his example, that the ideal was to not marry. Right? I have another friend who wonders if we should wear first century style shoes. Right? Is that what's meant by that? To mirror the, to mirror Christ, obviously not. Um, so what are we supposed to follow? It seems to me that the call to follow Jesus is primarily about the possession of a willingness to suffer, even at the sacrifice of our own lives, as we obey God, and as we, through this obedience to God, seek to love our neighbor, including our enemy neighbor, as we love God and as we love ourselves. And I want to talk more about that sacrifice in a moment. So the question at any one point in a Christ follower's mind, I think is gonna be something like this. How do I love my neighbor now in these circumstances, given the options that I have? And in conflict situations, it seems clear that we cannot love both the victimizer and the victim in precisely the same way. So say it this way, if one of my neighbors, let's call him my enemy neighbor, is kicking in the face of my innocent neighbor without cause and won't stop, what do I do, right? Uh, it seems clear that whatever I do has to be loving and I have to love both of them now. It's not that, well, I can love the 
victim neighbor now, and then later I'll love the enemy neighbor. I'm called to love both of them right now. But it should be clear that I can't love both of them in exactly the same way, in exactly the same moment, but I have to love them both. <coughs> right? So what will that look like? So the Christian realist summed this section up, knows that there is no, nothing impossible about wrath and love being directed toward the same individual or toward the same people at the same time. So when Jesus loves, he is holy. When Jesus exhibits wrath, he is love. God in his perfections must be wrathful against his rebel image bearers, for they have offended him. God in his perfections must be loving toward his rebel image bearers, for he is that kind of God. So Paul's injunction, insofar as it depends on you, be at peace with all men, is a commitment, as we'll see, to force in the last resort, insofar as it depends on you, live in peace. We are to do whatever we legitimately can to make peace with our enemies, including praying that God would bless them and work in their conscience for them to stand down. And more than this, we are to take those early and positive steps to do good in the world, alleviating where we are able cause for animosity in the first place. Nevertheless, there are indeed no sure ways to soften hard hearts, and the practice of peace has limitations. Peace at the price of truth is never being asked for. The Christian, because he is a Christian, can't do those things. As far as it depends on you, it's not just a goad toward peace, but it's also a limit, right? Given who you are, redeemed by Christ and created to carry the image of God, you are called to preserve peace. But you, given who you are, have no call nor right to trump the veto of those who would refuse to reciprocate your peaceful endeavors. Our enemies always have a vote on how we relate to them. We have to take that vote seriously. All right, I'm gonna move on to the second term. And this is the fall. This is more empirically obvious. And this comes out of the prayer, taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is and not as we would have it. So a summary statement of this. God created human beings to love him and to be loved by him. But love, of course, cannot be compelled because love must be free or it's, it's not love. So human beings were made with freedom. And the cost of human freedom necessarily includes risk because to be free means to never be wholly under the control of another's will. So human beings are free to rebel. And I think it's clear, 13.8 days worth of names make it clear, uh, that rebel we have. And so holding our role as image bearers in contempt, human beings abandoned this mandate to exercise responsible dominion in favor of self-centered lust for domination and a will to power uh, in more extreme cases, instead of loving our neighbors. Um, instead of loving our neighbors, human beings prey on our neighbors. That's just what we do. So a preliminary task, it seems, of Christian ethical reasoning is to acquire as accurate a description of the facts on the ground as we can, taking the world as it is and not as we would have it. Uh, so we see that evil exists, and we don't need to be particularly super sophisticated about what we mean when we say the word evil. It's the political manifestation, in the political manifestation, evil is the, the desire to dominate, not exercise dominion, but to dominate other human beings. Um, and we, can, we can get into a little bit of what that might look like in a bit, but I'll, uh, I'm gonna leave off some of the graphic examples because I think if you pay attention to the news, you know what they are. Uh, history attests to the human capacity, the inventiveness of human evil. Um, it's near limitless. There's a, um, a book happily titled The Encyclopedia of Genocide um, that puts it this way. It says, in total, during the first 88 years of the previous century, almost 170 million men, women, and children, non-combatants, were shot, beaten, tortured, knifed, burned, starved, frozen, crushed, or worked to death buried alive, drowned, hanged, bombed, or killed in any other of the myriad other ways that governments have inflicted death on unarmed, helpless citizens and foreigners. So the reality of the fall, it's important. Christian realists have to take that on board. 
All right. If we get reality wrong, our ethics will be hamstrung from the beginning, and we're likely to be ineffective. All right. Um, so there's, there's two cousin errors that I think the Christian realist has to avoid as we attempt to encounter the nature of reality. The first, as I've already suggested, is sentimentality. It's playing down human evil. We shouldn't do that. But the other is equally important. We shouldn't be so cynical that we downplay human goodness. We must remember not just original sin, but we must go back to our original goodness and the fact that even if we've marred the image of God, like the thumbprint is still there, right? We still have a general disposition toward good, or at least most of us do. There are some monsters among us. Um, both of these things, the capacity for goodness, the capacity for evil, the desire for both are marbled within us. Uh, you know, so we should remember the Joseph Stalins and the Bin Ladens, but we should also remember the Mother Teresas, the Alvin Yorks, the Oscar Schindlers. Do you guys know who Mr. Rogers is? Ah, yeah. oh, good, all right. The, yeah, the old guy like me in the back, he knows, but the rest of you do too, and this is a good thing. Now, Mr. Rogers once said that when he was a boy, and he would see something scary in the news, his mother would always tell him, look for the helpers. She said, there's always helpers there. All right, so I think this is a commitment that we should take on board as a discipline, right? In moments of crisis, always look for the helpers. Uh, in his great novel, which I think is celebrating an anniversary this year, Albert Camus' The Plague is all about helpers that are healers in a moment of, of, of great plague. Like, I know this is going to seem like fiction to you, but there was this community that was overrun with an, a pandemic, and like people were dying from it, and they had to stay in their homes. Sounds crazy, I know, but check it out. It's called The Plague. Um, when I wrote this, that hadn't happened yet, so this might be a little too close to home. Uh, but in there, you know, he, the, the whole novel is a celebration of, of helpers, of, of healers. And as a, as a point of biographical interest, Albert Camus wrote this when he was convalescing uh, in a little hill town uh, during the Second World War. This hill town that he wrote in was above the valley in which a town called Le Chambon exists. Does anybody know what occurred in Le Chambon in the course of the Second World War? This town of uh, French Huguenots, Christians, uh, nearly a very small village, but they nearly doubled their size in hidden Jews. They, they, they became known as a place of sanctuary. Um, and there's some suggestion that Albert Camus knew what was going on because he was involved in the French resistance. And they think that he modeled some of the behaviors in the plague after what he was witnessing in Le Chambon. It's a pleasant fiction if it's not true, um, but the whole, the whole purpose of the plague is that these helpers in small ways in standing against this pandemic and trying to heal their neighbors and, and provide some succor to their neighbors represent those who stand against the totalitarian will, right? So look for the helpers, they're always there. How we behave in this world, the risks we are willing to take for one another um, are important. Uh, we should notice uh, many of the ethical tools of Christian realism do in fact notice and have to take all these things into account and we have to allow them to motivate us toward other centered acts of self-donation. Right? All right. To riff on um, Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, let me back up a moment. One of the ways, one of the tools, the ethical tools that Christians have to bring together this marbling of good and evil, to take that on board into account and to work against it, is what I'm going to move into now, which is the just war tradition. I want to say a little bit about this. To riff on Niebuhr, because human beings are morally evil, the just war tradition is necessary. But because human beings are good, the just war tradition is possible. All right? So we have it because we're evil, we can do it because we're good. So this brings us to our third point, to change with courage what must be altered, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace so that we may be reasonably happy in this life. So I've gone through creation, I've gone through fall, this is restoration, all right? And it should, by now you should be keyed in, it's approximate restoration, all right? I intend to go for about 20 more minutes, and then we're going to open it to questions. We should have ample time for lots of that. All right, 
here's a summary statement. In his grace, God did not leave humanity utterly without recourse against human evil. Among much else, he instituted human government to protect the innocent, to requite injustice, and to punish evil in order to maintain the political goods of order, justice, and therefore peace in the face of an intransigent enemy posing sufficiently grave risk, and in the last resort, conflict, including the conflict of war, is sometimes the only avenue towards peace. All right? So Paul calls the sovereign, the head of a people, Paul calls the sovereign God's servant who works for your good as an, and as an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Um, I alluded a moment ago to what Elstein wrote after those planes hit those buildings. But she says in the same book that when she watched those buildings fall, she turned to a friend and she said, well, now we remember what governments are for. All right? And she had in mind the fact that a government's basic task is to provide the conditions for justice and order, and therefore, hopefully, an approximation of peace. And that without this kind of government that does these things and is committed to maintaining those things, those quotidian goods that I enumerated earlier aren't necessarily possible. All right. Um, you know, can, uh, Elshane always saw that the government's mandate to provide for order and justice was replicated uh, or amplified even in the vocation of not just every individual but every family, every small community, every community group, these sorts of things. There's the government, there's the individual, and then in between is glommed all this thick stuff that human beings should employ in order to bring about the conditions for justice and order. These are all smaller spheres of sovereignty. Aristotle understood the family to be a microcosm of a larger political community. He was on to something. Bless you. Excuse me. <laughs> all right. When these small sort of kingdoms, the families, the civic institutions, when those things are functioning well, government can recede, right? That I think all of us, even in this town, should think, well, that's a good thing. I know some of you would be out of work. I'm an ethicist. You know, I long for the day when I am not needed. Uh, we're needed still. All right, the primary reason for the government's existence is remedial, right? Um, it's a Band-Aid. Uh, it's to prevent from happening the worst things that human beings can do to one another. Uh, sometimes, of course, some human beings cannot be talked about, talked out of doing the worst things that they can do to other human beings. So sometimes these human beings actually have to be knocked out of doing these things. And the Christian intellectual tradition has yielded rich resources touching on all dimensions of human conflict, both small and large. And it's identified a range of conceptual and practical tools, soft and hard, uh, that can help toward resolution. And the just war tradition is a moral framework by which Christian intelligence, I think, has thought best about war for most of its history. And I want to just kind of quickly run through some of this, uh, but I think it's important to have a handle on, on what it looks like. So you might already know the just war tradition is classically broken into two major groups. There's the use ad bellum, which just means justice toward war, or loosely translated, when is it right to fight? Okay? And then there's a second category, major category, called use in bello, which translates to justice in war, or a summary uh, translation is, how do you rightly fight that war that's right to fight? Okay? So the first one, uh, this use ad bellum, when is it right to fight? Uh, gives us three conditions that need to be met before a war can be proper. We have to have a proper authority. Again, this gestures toward order, right? Order is central. You have to have a proper authority. You have to have a just cause. You have to have a right intention. These three things have to be in place. And these three things, not by accident, map onto what Augustine understood to be the three chief political goods of order, justice, peace. So sovereign authority is order, just cause is justice, and right intent is peace. So these, these are there. To say briefly, a ruler's right to rule is defined by his or her or its responsibility to secure and protect the order and justice, therefore the peace, of the political community, and to contribute to orderly, just, and peaceful relations between it and other political communities. So in this conception, um, 
except in rare circumstances, the use of armed force can only be undertaken by a public authority for the public good. All right, so when a public authority uses force for the public good, that's bellum, war. Um, if anybody, including a sovereign authority, uses force for private good, that's duellum, right, from which we get the word duel, right? Bellum and duellum, war and duel. Wars can be good or bad, but in this conception, duels can always only be bad. So the use of force for private gain is always only bad. In the Augustinian universe, bellum can mirror caritas or charity, love, right? So you could go to war for reasons of love. That's possible. Duellum in the Augustinian universe can only ever be cupiditas or cupidity, so self-centered, self-directed love, which is a disordering of love, all right? If you want to know more about that, we could talk more about it. All right, that's probably enough on sovereign authority, um, except to say uh, it's helpful to, to consider that kings can unking themselves. Um, somebody is a sovereign because they adhere to these responsibilities of sovereignty. When a sovereign fails to adhere to these responsibilities, they abdicate sovereignty. Whether they know it or not, whether they relinquish power or not, they have unkinged themselves. And Christian intellectual tradition has a very careful, very uncomfortable set of, of tools that you can employ to remedy that situation. All right, the second condition that must be present before going to war is just cause, as I've said. Um, <coughs> just causes, you can break them into three. There's protecting the innocent. There is requiting an injustice or righting a wrong. Uh, and there's punishing the guilty or punishing wrongdoers, punishing evil. These three things have to be there. Um, you notice I didn't say self-defense. Under international law, one of the only reasons you can go to war is self-defense. But here I've qualified everything. Protect the innocent. Uh, correct injustices, right, wrongs, right? Uh, or punish evil. So you, you see the qualifications in each of those things. Self-defense, technically, doesn't have a qualification. If I attack you and you attack me back and start to overwhelm me, I might think, well, now, you know, I have a right to self-defense. Well, you don't, right? The only people who have a right to defend themselves are the innocent, right? You have no right to defend yourself if you're an unjust aggressor. Whatever you have coming to you is owed to you, right? So that's why the classic expression in Thomas Aquinas of these three causes avoids the complexities or the inaccuracies of self-defense and says instead, protect the innocent, right wrongs, punish evil. Um, what you should see here is that the overwhelming preoccupation of just war is to requite or to vindicate justice. So to vindicate is to prove the rightness of justice, to stand up for justice. That's the overwhelming concern. Some will suggest, as, as Hauerwas and others suggest, that the Christian just war tradition carries a presumption against violence or a presumption against war. Um, and on the surface, it seems like it. Well, I'm thinking about going to war, but I've got this criteria that I have to look at. Okay, so this is helping me know, well, maybe I shouldn't go to war. But one of the things that determines that you should, in fact, consider the use of force uh, is the presence of an injustice. So the classical expression within just war casuistry is that the presumption is against injustice. That's the overwhelming concern, right? Just war is concerned. If you see an injustice, you have to respond. And depending on the severity of the situation, are the innocent sufficiently threatened? Is the injustice grave enough? Is the evil sufficiently evil that it warrants a more kinetic, a harder response? All right? The preoccupation is against injustice. All right. And finally, this last one I want to linger on just a little bit. The final condition of when it is right to fight is that you should be aimed at peace. That's the only proper intention of war. Now, this intention can be conveyed in both negative and positive terms. So negatively, we are reminded by Augustine of what we ought always to avoid in war. And these are things like hatred. We should avoid a desire to see the enemy suffer per se. We should avoid cruelty, uh, a lust for power over others, and the like. And positively, this intention toward peace reminds us that the properly desired end of war is always reconciliation, all right? And that may be a bridge too far. You know, I speak in ideals, um, but the idea is that it's through conflict 
that relationships can be mended. So we enter into conflict in order for reconciliation, remembering frustratingly that the enemy always has a vote, and that might be a bridge too far, but that's the aim. And that should motivate the way we fight. <coughs> um, there are probably certain ways of fighting that make the possibility of peace and reconciliation impossible. All right? Although the war in the Pacific during the 1940s suggests that there's a lot of room for fighting um, aggressively and still bringing about the conditions for peace. And I'll say more about that particular example in a moment. All right, this, this aim of peace, and this is a second qualification maybe, this aim for peace is in the first place, peace for the innocent victim under assault. If at the end of the day, all I've done is restored peace to the innocent victims, I could be discontent with that, but in one sense in this world, that's pretty sufficient. But in the second sense, um, it is peace with the enemy as well aiming toward the restoration of the enemy, as Augustine says, into the fellowship of humanity. Um, of course, you cannot reconcile with someone who has not seen the error of their ways, who has repented and given you solid reasons to trust that they will not seek to harm you again. And there's a whole lot more that should be said about that. Um, we must employ a wide array of foreign policy options. When hard power is under consideration, there's another array of options ranging from deterrent behavior to small scale actions, and then all the way up to, to major war. There's an awful lot we can be doing, including accumulating believable power to prevent war from happening. But we have to do these various things. All right, and again, there's more that can be said about that, but I'm gonna leave most of that for now, except to give a historic caution. Um, in certain kinds of conflicts, this aiming at peace requires that we first have to take the fight out of the enemy. And I think this is particularly grim hearing for Christian audiences, um, because we want to be nice. In certain kinds of conflicts, this aiming at peace requires that we take the fight out of the enemy. There are occasions where we have to fight to win. Sort of a basic presumption of the just war is that if a fight is right to fight, it's right to win. Uh, that's less popular and less obvious, even in international relations theory, than you might think. So one of the lessons of the Great War, and the Great War was, of course, that war to end all wars. It was the one just before the Second World War. <laughs> um, this reminds us of the truth of what I'm talking about here. Um, world War I, I think the premier lesson from World War I is that decisive victory one in which the fighting has really actually settled the matter, and everyone knows who lost, is, I say here sometimes, I would probably say always crucial. Uh, general Pershing feared the armistice, the American General Pershing, because he, he, he felt that the Germans did not know that they had been licked, okay? And of course, we have testimonies from German generals in France, so enemy-occupied territory, who told their troops, we are standing down in occupied land. We have never been defeated in the field, right? March back to Germany proud. And, you know, it took just a generation to rekindle old hatreds and to raise up another generation of young men to feed to the fires. Um, all right. You know, more can be said here about what this looks like. Uh, I think General MacArthur after the war in Japan, which was a, you know, obviously any war is going to be particularly hard and brutal. Um, the Pacific War and the level of animosity between American troops and Japanese troops um, was extraordinary. It was a very different conflict in some ways than the conflict we had with Germany. Uh, and after the war in the Pacific, after the dropping of the bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, <laughs> What General Douglas MacArthur did in occupied Japan was, I think, nothing short of extraordinary in this, in this move toward bringing peace and recon reconciliation to the Japanese people. Um, and the one thing I want to read from this whole section, there's more that I could say in the Q&A if you're interested, but General, De General MacArthur, when he announced his retirements, uh, gave an address to a joint session of Congress, and he declared that he considered himself simply an old soldier who has tried to do his duty as God has given him the light to see that duty. And that duty, he understood, was to destroy in order to build up. 
Okay, and I think nowhere was that sense of duty more on display than his behavior in the Pacific, both during the war and then afterward. This idea that you destroy sometimes in order to build up. Um, a favorite film of mine, Hacksaw Ridge. I don't know if anybody has seen Hacksaw Ridge. Great. Okay, great. Um, there's a couple scenes in there that I like, but I, but I think betrays Desmond Doss's basic misunderstanding of what war ought all to be about. So Desmond Doss, uh, a conscientious objector, or as he said, a conscientious, I can't remember what he said, but he, he said he wasn't a conscientious objector, he sort of was, but he wanted to go to war anyway as a medic, uh, not to carry a weapon, but he wanted to do his part. But he says on one occasion, um, while other people are taking life, I'm going to be saving it as a medic. And that works on the surface. Or he said elsewhere, it doesn't seem to me such a bad thing when everybody else is breaking the world apart that I would put a little bit of it back together. Again, great motivation. But it also betrays a basic misunderstanding of what the business of just war should be. And Douglas MacArthur gets it right. Sometimes you have to enter into conflict. Sometimes you have to break things in order to bring about healing. Can Desmond say people of both sides. Yeah, oh yeah. No, he was, uh, it's an extraordinary story. Absolutely extraordinary story. All right, um, very briefly, the second bit, how do you rightly fight that fight that's right to fight, the use in bellow? Um, this is made up of, of uh, in, there are three, three requirements. The second requirement is proportionality. And just, this just argues that the amount of force you use should result in a greater amount of good than a greater amount of harm. And much more needs to be said about that. Um, the third element is discrimination, which basically means you intentionally, and I put a heavy emphasis on that word, you intentionally target only those who mean you harm, who are liable to harm, so combatants. You do not intentionally target non-combatants. That's the second and third. The first is something that you're not gonna find in the Christian literature, and this is a shame. You'll find it in international law, and this is one place where international law does a better job than, than Christian intelligence. But the first requirement in the use in bellow of how do you rightly fight that fight that's right to fight is necessity, right? Any battlefield option that you have, any battlefield tactic that you employ ought to be necessary. Uh, that seems obvious, but it's not always done in practice, but it's a question of stewardship. Wars cost lives and material. And you should only spend lives and spend material when required. And here's where this aim of peace uh, and victory is important because any action you do in war ought in some discernible way contribute toward victory, right? So one action after another, this, this tactic in this battle leads to this campaign leads to this war. And so all those things need to be somehow directed at victory. So necessity, proportionality, and discrimination. All right, what I hope you see in this is that the just war tradition is one aspect of the practice of the vocation of responsible dominion in a broken world. So there's an injustice, and we have to exercise the responsibility of vindicating that injustice. The just war tradition is not a set of, go set of categorical imperatives. Um, it's, a, it's just a framework for cultivating wisdom. And in fact, there's all these qualifiers that go against these three requirements, things like, do you have a chance of winning? So even if you have a just cause and you've got a right intent and you've got a sovereign authority, if you have no chance of winning, if all you're gonna do is make things worse, if all you're gonna do is contribute to more lost lives and more broken things, then maybe wisdom dictates you stand down. Right, so probability of success, last resort, things like this. Um, this idea of categorical imperatives, um, I think there are actually very few genuinely categorical imperatives, so absolute, uh, rules for the Christian. Um, I'm convinced that there's arguably only one rule for the Christian. Any idea what that is? Come on, Matt, you've hung out with me long enough. Golden rule. Okay, loosely translated one word. What was that? Love. Stick a fork in her, she's done, right? Good. I think there's only one real rule for the Christian, it's love, all right? But as I've already said, love has multiple shapes in a conflicted world, all right? The primary aim of the Just War Framework is to show us when and how to love our neighbor through rescuing them, whether our victim neighbor under assault who needs deliverance from the assailant, or our enemy neighbor 
who needs to be rescued from the evils of their own wrongdoing. That also needs to be unpacked because not every enemy we have is an ideologue who is knowingly doing evil. Some of them are just poor chumps like me, right? Um, and we can love them in different ways even as we use lethal force against them, right? We can talk more about that if you want. Um, but rescue in both cases is aimed at the flourishing of our neighbor. In both cases, the prize is peace. And so I think this is why in both Thomas Aquinas and St. Paul, you see their discussions of the use of force set within a larger discussion of love. So if you look in the Summa Theologica, uh, Thomas Aquinas is talking about charity, love, and he seems to take a break, but it's not a break, where he talks about war. And then he continues talking about love. Right? So war is set within his larger discussion of love, and it's, and it's there for a reason. And in St. Paul, you see in Romans, uh, starting in Romans 12, 9, where he says, cling to what is good, or, you know, or love what is good, hate what is evil. Right? He goes into that discussion of love, and then that, you've got to pull out your chapter numbers, because the chapter numbers can be misleading. Pop out the cha chapter numbers. He's talking about love. Then he talks about government and the use of the sword. And then he begins, in what is the middle of chapter 13, talking about love again. Right? So both Paul and St. Thomas have this like love sandwich, where it's love, war, love. Right? Or love, force, love. And I think that's significant. So properly understood, just war is an act of love in the last resort. All right? This is what love looks like in extremity. Um, here's where I'm going to say something relatively nasty about pacifism, but I think it's important for me to say this. Um, the pacifist understanding of peace is sometimes uh, tends, ten, and their understanding of what love requires, in my estimation, sometimes tends toward the maudlin and the sentimental. I think it appears overly concerned with personal piety set against the conditions of the world. All right? Um, Say it this way, Stanley Auerwas argues for the church to represent an alternative peaceable kingdom to the earthly kingdom that's elsewhere on offer. It seems to me and seems to others that if this peaceable kingdom in which Christians do not participate in the exertions of power, if that peaceable kingdom were possible, then it seems to me that God would ordain that kingdom and not the king, the earthly kingdom, the kingdom of the sword. Um, but both are there, right? So he must, God, feel that the earthly kingdom is necessary. And if this earthly kingdom, if the, the kingdom that wields the sword to punish wrongdoing and to protect the innocent, if that kingdom is required, and Christians decide, no, we're going to be an alternative community and not participate in that one, we're going to be over here being a peaceable kingdom. The problem with that, it seems, to me is that the Christian community then condemns uh, in principle what it requires in practice. What do I mean by that? Um, C.S. Lewis put it this way, if all good, this is a loose translation, or loose translation, he was British, it still requires some translation, um, loose summary, uh, if all good people were pacifists very soon, there would be no pacifists, right? Uh, so we depend on, if we, if we claim pacifism as the Christian ethic, then we depend on in, we reject in principle what we require in practice, okay? That seems at least a dereliction of responsibility. Um, but worse than that, if the reason we reject the use of the sword is because we think it goes against a Christian duty to love, if we think it stains our fingers and, and tarnishes our soul then to stand out of that and allow other people to do that on our behalf is to ask that other people do our own dirty work. And that seems to me a dereliction of charity, an abandonment of the Christian responsibility to love our neighbor. Okay, if I was a fiction writer, I'm not. If I was a fiction writer, I would write a book about a future dystopia in which only Christians fight wars because only Christians have the moral framework, I think, at the end of the day to understand the cause, the justification, and the limits of the use of force. All right, that's enough on that. Fourth, uh, just two more points, and I'll try to be brief. Um, the final condition of this right intention, 
um, should be the proper aim of war. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, uh, I need to skip ahead. All right, fourth. Um, this is a subset of restoration. All right, that was our, our third point. And I call this responsibility or subtitled the American sword. And again, in, in invoking Gene Elstein, this is the Spider-Man ethic. So with great responsibility, or with great power comes great responsibility. And I just want to say a little word here on power, because I think power has an increasingly bad reputation uh, in the modern world. It seems to me very simple. God has power. Power is therefore a good. Power is a basic component of political life. Paul Ramsey said it's the essence of political life. You have to have power in order to have politics. Like any good, of course, human beings have invented all sorts of clever ways to abuse power to tarnish the goods. But abuse, as someone has said, doesn't invalidate use or proper use. So I think Christians have to be concerned with finding ways to positively use power. And the question is, how is power used and to what end? And if we return to the Sermon on the Mount, you'll recall that the first term, blessed are the meek, right? I think this gives us a hint of what power should look like in the Christian world. Um, if I say the word meek, what do you think of? Meek is? Peaceful. What's that? Peaceful. Okay, well, that's, that's true. Weak. Yeah, what'd you say? Weak. Weak. Weak, right? Yeah. Peaceful, weak, right? Meek is weak, something like this. Um, the term in the Sermon on the Mount is a little bit different, right? Probably most of you know this. Uh, the term meek here was used elsewhere to signify a war horse that is under restraint, right? So a war horse that has been uh, tamed, you know, useful to its rider. Um, and, you know, and a war horse in, in, in the chivalric tradition, right, was a thing to behold. It was, could be up to like 2,000 pounds. They could apparently move their 2,000 pounds up to 35 miles an hour. And their function was to smash into enemy lines and scatter them. And where at the control of its rider, they could kick and bite and do all sorts of other, you know, damaging things. All right? Meek was used to describe power under restraint. And so then the question here just becomes, okay, so power isn't the evil. It's the unrestrained use of power that could contribute to evil. And then the question really becomes, who's holding the reins? Right? And, and again, to gesture back to the just world tradition, the just world tradition is supposed to be all about teaching us how to use power under restraint. And that's what it means to be meek, all right? which I think is, is pretty extraordinary. Um, so the exercise of power or force or violence for the sake of something larger and more important than ourselves um, can be a tool for goodness. And here you can think of what I think is the classic American genre of film, the Western, right? Um, and it's a, it's a, there's a typical motif in the Western. There's an anarchic situation in which good people are just trying to eke out some sort of life together. But there's a bully, right? And the bully is preventing them from being able to build a civilization. And they can't help themselves. And into this world incarnates a gunslinger who you know, uses force or controlled violence to bring about the conditions required that civilization might take hold. Right? So that's, that's this idea of meekness. Now, again, to, to gesture toward our discomfort with power, what happens at the end of every Western, or most Westerns? He rides off into the sunset, right? Which we could get all romantic about. Oh, he's going to find other communities to help. But very often, what happens within the context of the film is that the townspeople say something, and this is, again, a loose translation, thank you for your help, now get the hell out. Right? So if you've seen Shane, for instance, which is sort of the classic expression of this, um, Shane is the little boy, and his mother knows that they need help to defend themselves against the bullies who they want to run cattle through all the, the ranches. Uh, and the gunslinger comes into town, and she demands that the guns leave the valley. But again, you know, this is sort of a, a naive hope because the guns won't leave the valley. Good men with guns might leave the valley, but the bad men with the guns are going to stay unless they're kicked out. So the good man with the gun kicks the bad man with guns out, and then he tells the boy, go and tell your mother that the guns have left the valley. And he's wounded. We don't know if he's going to die or not, but he gets on his horse and he rides off into the sunset because he has no place in civilized society. 
right? You see the same thing in what I think is one of the greatest Westerns ever, which is Logan, the last Wolverine film. Have you seen this? Who's seen Logan? Yeah? Okay. This is remedial viewing. You have to see it. So Logan follows the motif of a Western. And in fact, in Logan, if you remember, they actually watch Shane, right? And then at the end, uh, this idea is invoked. The girl says over Logan's grave, I guess that's a spoiler, sorry, um, the guns have left the valley, right? It's a, this idea that the man of violence is necessary, but they have no place in civilized culture. And if we had time, we could talk a lot about how we repatriate our war fighters um, into civilian life. And we do, for the most part, a pretty bad job of this. Um, and Matt Gobush is involved in some projects to try to make that process better. Right? But that's an important thing. How do we in reintegrate men and increasingly women of violence back into civilized society? Next week, I'm going to get yelled at by Eric Patterson if he hears this video, because I keep saying the word violence. Strictly speaking, violence is a pejorative. Force is what disciplined just war scholars will use in place of violence, right? But for, for now, I'm using both synonymously. All right. That's probably mostly enough on that. Um, I am intrigued by this idea of the Spider-Man ethic. With great power comes great responsibility. I think an important question for some of you who work on the Hill and work in policy positions is just how much power ought America to try to cultivate? Um, and I once heard a good answer, a bit simplistic, but I think pretty effective answer. Uh, a Christian friend once asked, you know, how much money should I try to earn or something to this effect? I was terribly concerned about, like, how much money is too much money? And the answer that was given is, well, I think you should try to earn, you know, given your passions and your talents and all the rest, you should try to earn as much money as you can without abandoning or, or putting in jeopardy other responsibilities that you have so that you can give as much away as you can, so you can use it and leverage it to do as much good as you can, right? Simplistic rule, but a reasonable one. If there's a parallel, then I think nations, um, without abandoning other responsibilities that they have, ought to try to cultivate as much power as they can, um, and then to use that power in beneficent ways so as to make that power sufferable to those that are beneath it. Because the, the way the world goes, somebody is going to lead it. Some coalition or some nation is going to lead an anarchic world in which there is no established sovereign. Um, and call me a jingoist, but my preference right now, even still, despite all else, is America. And so I would like to see America cultivate as much power as it can um, and use it in beneficent ways, right? Um, including building up other nations so they can exercise their own power in their own region and all the rest. We shouldn't try to solve everything, etc. But as a general principle, I think you catch my, my drift. All right. Um, that's enough about all that. The last thing I want to say is this, the, the last point, um, and I'm going to truncate it, grace to change with courage what must be altered, serenity to accept what cannot be helped, and the wisdom to know the one from the other. So what I want us to see here is the Christian realist commitment to restraint and to sobriety, right? There are an awful lot of problems in the world. We can't solve them all. Um, alongside human government, uh, the Christian has all sorts of other responsibilities that it can use to try to bring good to the world. It's not all about power expressions. It's not all about political manifestations. Christian intelligence must help the government to exercise power in responsible, humble, and prudent ways. Maybe first by clarifying the ground on which government must rest, helping government to understand what is its job and what isn't its job. Um, helping government to accurately describe the nature of reality where we can. Um, Christian realism recognizes that judgment is essential, right? And again, to invoke my, my late supervisor, Jean Elstein, she once wrote that a, a robust politics of democratic argument turns on making the right distinctions, right? So again, this harkens back to this idea of getting reality right, but we need to learn to tell the difference between certain things that appear to be similar, but really aren't. So the Christian tradition can offer remedial assistance to a culture that in its zeal to obliterate difference seems often unable to render basic distinctions between things like right and wrong, justice and revenge, combatant and non-combatant, soldier and terrorist, innocent and victim, victim versus victimizer, all the rest. Um, I think Christians can help with that. So, and then lastly, uh, the church can 
counsel and modesty of purpose. Uh, it ultimately has to remember that it's God, not humanity, that has the ultimate responsibility for history. And as I've said before, the 20th century is sufficient proof that only horrors follow when some human beings believe that they have ultimate responsibility for the conditions of history. The Christian realist accepts that the best we can do is to do no harm, to prevent the worst, and to help where we can. All right, so that went a little bit longer than I thought. I hope it's so useful. Those are five points, not eight, thank God, on Christian realism. So now I think we have 35 minutes for questions, right? 8.30, we're stopping? Is that right? You say sure, you're so agreeable, but is that proper? All right. Oh, we can go as long as we want. <laughs> so get some drinks, kick back. Questions, comments, rebukes, funny stories, clarifications? Michael's leaving, he didn't like it. Please. Sure. And so, maybe introduce yourself and yeah, who we are. And I'm Andrew Davenport. Um, so one of the principles of kind of the just war tradition that you talked about is like having a realistic chance of winning. Mm. So how does that approach situations such as say like the American Revolution where one yeah. uh, historian might look on that or even someone at that time and say there is no realistic chance of you winning against what was at the time considered the world superpower um, or for example like last stand type situations which we tend to look upon and say oh that's virtuous of you right. to make a last stand despite the odds being completely against you and you know that you're going to you know meet your end. Mm -hmm. Real quick, do, do they need yeah. to be? You should, uh, speakers oh. should go up here. Okay. Can, can that be passed around or not? Is it loose? Or is, it's, oh, it's all, uh, not, that's not okay. loose. All right, you can form a line or do whatever. Or, <laughs> okay. All right, um, let me handle the, the second part first because I think that's the easier piece. Um, last stands, right? So I think last stands typically, not always, occur within wars. So the Alamo or um, um, Masada, you know, different things like this. Um, those, are, I think, are, are easier to defend because they, they may carry all sorts of strategic or even just, and I say just advisedly, just is never just like simple thing. Um, they may carry strategic or symbolic value, right? Um, so remember the Alamo, you know, uh, quickened spirits for the rest of the conflict. Uh, so, so that, I think, you can say there are occasions where it's, it's very clear that um, being willing to fight to the death um, is permissible. I say that somewhat advisedly because I think one of the crises in the Pacific during World War II was the Japanese insistence on fighting to the last man, uh, which I think bred, helped breed a character of war that resulted in all sorts of unnecessary miseries. Um, and I, I think you can draw a direct line from the fighting in Iwo Jima, the Japanese style of fighting in Iwo Jima and Okinawa, um, to the mushroom cloud over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I mean, it, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a historical fact. Um, and there ought to be times where people stand down um, because you, you dictate the terms of the fight. So while I think there is a place, a right place for last stands, um, you, you you better be sure you don't teach your enemy that they really do have to kill you down to the last person in order to, to win a war. Um, the question of, from the outset, uh, this seems like, a lo like we have no chance of winning. Um, you know, it's, it, I, I think it provides a big caution against this idea of probability of success uh, because, you know, the best laid plans for victory can go to hell in a handbasket when the first shot is fired. Well, the, the assumption that we are going to get it handed to us could also go to hell in a handbasket, happily so, when the first shot is fired. Um, I wish we had a recent example of a major military power attacking a weaker nation, and that weaker nation, which didn't seem to have a chance of lasting three days, ended up handing it to the stronger power. I, you know, just It would be convenient if we had an example like that, right? So there are times. Uh, what about the six-day war? Or the six-day war, Is that right? A good example? No, it's a great example. Well, I mean, it, you, you could probably look at every war Israel fought, yeah. where, with the exception of historic precedents, every war they fought, there's not a chance they're going to win it, right? And yet they do over and over and over yeah. again. Like the Philistines, they, they had a secret weapon. Right. They, they trusted that secret weapon, and somebody took it out. So this stresses why. 
probability of success is a prudential criteria of the just war tradition and not an absolute requirement. Um, it's just saying, have you considered your, the odds that you're going to get what you want? Um, and there are times where you think, yeah, it looks like we don't have much of a chance. Um, let me also answer it this way. Another prudential concern is, is this idea of proportionality. And I've given the, the maybe the positive way of discussing proportionality, which is to say, okay, if we launch this war aimed at this kind of victory, are we likely to get, so likely, probability of success moves immediately in, are we likely to get more good than bad that comes from that? You have to ask the proportionality question the other way as well and say, okay, if we don't fight this war that's right to fight, are we likely to get more good or bad out of that? And so there, all of a sudden, you might say, look, I don't think we're going to win this war. But I know that losing it, we're not fighting it, is going to result in all sorts of horrors. And so we, we, like, we have to fight. Um, and so that also, you know, the prudence works in, in both directions. Yeah, please. And if you guys want to form a queue, or what's, what's a queue? A line, right? They have these little like dice-like things yeah. that we yeah. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Jerry Foley. And I want to say the idea about, um, you know, fighting for peace. Mm -hmm. When you think about we're fighting to maintain peace, suppose you're the other side, maybe there's a certain leader that you want to get rid of this leader. Mm -hmm. If you can't kill the leader, mm -hmm. if you're just able to take this leader as a prisoner, how much would this change the outcome? Is everybody else on that side, are they going to be with him or against him? See? Right. I mean, like, think how many times in the past, like, suppose Hitler had been taken as prisoner. Mm -hmm. What would have the outcome have been? Sure. Yeah, great. Uh, yep. I mean, you would, of course, have to look at case by case, right? I think there yeah. are certain cases where if you remove the head, everybody will say, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. Let's move on. Yeah. And there are certain cases where they'll say, okay, you've yeah. taken our head, we're going to keep fighting, yeah. like take our next head, yeah. right? Um, there are certain cases in which uh, maybe you're not taking the head, but you're taking the only people who know how to fight. Uh -huh. So I had a buddy during the Cold War, he was positioned in Germany, you know, across the line from his Russian counterpart or his Soviet counterpart, when in, when in later years he became his Russian counterpart, they met over, it was perestroika, they met over beer, and they were discussing Cold War tactics. Mm -hmm. And the Russians said that the reason, as Soviets, that we feared the United States is we knew that in order to stop you advancing, we would have to kill you all the way down to your lowliest private. Because you guys actually trust each other enough to get the battle plans, to train them up to be able to lead men and move equipment. Um, but we knew that we don't do any of that. And really, all you would have to do is kill our senior officers, and we would be dead in the water. Again, I wish there was a recent precedent to suggest that was true. But. Right? So I think it depends. It depends on the army, it depends yeah. on the regime. I have no problem if, if part of the question is within a just war moral ethic, is it right to decapitate? I have no problem with it because I think wars should be, with other qualifications, fought as quickly as possible. Um, and very often that means, you know, if you can kill one dude or, or gal, yeah. it could be a tyrannical woman, um, yeah. get rid of them. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, like I lived in Korea too, and I think. This is part of the problem right, with right. North Korea. They don't want open to the West because certain things he has, he would have to give up and sure. he would have to take care of his people. Right. In that case, okay. The caution, you know, mm -hmm. everything I say is overqualified. I'm terribly sorry. I do have dogmatic <laughs> positions. We can inquire about some of them. One caution would be mm -hmm. I'm fearful that America has taught our recent enemies <clears throat> that if you lose to America, your head of state dies. Right? That, that's a track record that mm -hmm. I think maybe we could be guilty of, yeah. mm -hmm. of establishing. And again, it's always helpful to let your enemies know that they have a way out, that they could survive. So a reason to stand down. If you think that losing to me means you're dead, you're not going to lose to me right? until you're dead. Mm -hmm. So that would be the only yeah. caution. Yeah. Then I also wanted to comment on the case where you said somebody asked you, how much money should I earn as a Christian? Sure. I think that's very sad. What, which part of that? Is well, that the question the, or the answer? No, the, the idea that somebody would ask you that is sad. Okay, why? 
because it proves if this person had studied scripture and all, would not have to ask you. They would know about tithing. They would know about a character like Joseph of Arimathea. Sure. Okay. And this, this is the sad part. Either the person has not studied or has not been taught what, what he needs to know. Okay. Yeah. Entirely possible. That's, my wife would second you. I, I ask my wife questions all the time that she thinks I should know the answer to. Okay, so. well, I mean, it's, <laughs> well, yeah. it's between you and your wife, you know. I mean, I you're know. not asking. I know. No, okay. point taken. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Matt Gobush, I know you want to get up. I've got a question. Here it comes. All right. Hi. Um, no Matt swearing, Gobush, contributing Matt. editor, uh, Providence. Um, Dr. Lebecki. So um, you equate, uh, in many respects, the Christian realist school of thought with just war and the just war tradition, which I yeah. I would tend to agree. Right. But the godfather of the Christian realist yes. school of thought didn't think so. Right. Didn't necessarily agree that right. just war thinking was congruent with with Christian realism. Yep. Can you explain that? Do what's, I, and what's your view on it? Do I get to bash Randall Niebuhr? Is that what you're asking me to do? No, you, you can't do that. He's the patron saint of Providence. That would... But, so, uh, so if you ask 10 Christian realists whether or not Reinhold Niebuhr is a just war or a just warrior, let's parse it, um, five of them will say yes, five of them will say no, right? Um, at Wheaton College, I don't know if they're listening now, but um, if I have it right, Mark Amstutz thinks that Reinhold Niebuhr is a just war warrior. Brian McGraw, rightly, says he's not. Um, so... <laughs> So Reinhold Niebuhr is rightly understood as the father of modern Christian realism. He is rightly revered as the patron saint of Providence Magazine, all of that. Um, Reinhold Niebuhr was a pacifist. So this is my thing. And uh, don't take my word for it, take Reinhold Niebuhr's word for it. So Reinhold Niebuhr has an essay entitled Why the Christian Church is, Pacif is Not Passive. Why the Christian Church is Not Pacifist, I think is the name of the essay. This is an important distinction. Regardless of what the title is, what he goes into here is a rejection, actually, of the idea that passivism, or no, is a rejection of the idea that the ethic of Jesus uh, is nonviolence. He says the pacifists are wrong about that. He says the ethic of Jesus is non-resistance to evil, which he takes to be something more significant, deeper, more committed than simply merely nonviolence. Um, and so he calls this the, the law of love. And he says, if you, you cannot read the Gospels and come to any conclusion other than the fact that Jesus at every turn counseled non-resistance to evil. And so in different places, Niebuhr will use, okay, so that's the law of love. He also says that incumbent upon human beings is a second law, the law of responsibility. This is the problem, is that these laws contradict, they clash. Um, responsibility means using things like coercion, aggression, right? Probably all the terms that you would see labeled under like toxic masculinity or something nowadays. And all these things are pejoratives that he says can't win, I can't remember how he phrases it, but something like these things can't win the sanction of the most sensitive moral spirit. But alas, sometimes the Christian has to do these things. Why? Well, he says it's just practical. If you pursue the law of love, Given the conditions of the world and probably your own heart, you're not going to get any love. You're going to just fail completely. And then you're not going to fix any of the crises around you. But if you pursue the law of responsibility and you use things like aggression and force to try to requite or vindicate just injustices, um, then you can do some of that. So you can fix some of the broken bits of the world. And guess what? You can qualify some of that with love. And so you can do these things in as loving a way as possible. So pursue responsibility, you'll get some responsibility, and you could even get a little bit of love thrown in. Um, but he considers it morally uh, evil to do. He says you cannot move responsibly throughout history without staining your, dirtying your hands, by which he means bringing on board yourself morally evil things, right? Um, Contrast that with my understanding of the classic just war tradition, which says no, um, Christians never choose between lesser evils. Christians always choose the greatest possible good. That's always the motivation. Your orientation is always toward the greatest possible good. 
Um, and force can be a moral good. It's not a lesser evil. Is that fair? Good. All right. I, I think there's more to be said about this, but uh, all of you have heard about post-traumatic stress disorder, right? <laughs> um, hopefully all of you have heard about moral injury. Moral injury? All right. All right. Moral injury is a proposed, disputed, I don't know why it's disputed, it's a refutable subset of post-traumatic stress disorder, which suggests a couple of different things, but one of the definitions of a moral injury is that there is a moral trauma that occurs when one does or allows to be done something that goes against a deeply held moral norm. And on the surface, that should be the case, right? So if you do something that goes against a moral norm, we sometimes call that sin, that should have a morally traumatizing effect on you, right? Um, I remember when my son was maybe two years old, my daughter was just under one, something exciting was happening outside the window, I don't remember what, maybe a siren or something. And my son was in the window, and my daughter jumped up on the couch to look out the window too, and he positioned himself right in front of her to block her off, and I looked at him, and with apparently a dad voice, I said, Dominic, why did you do that? And he looked at me and he went, <laughs> and he just burst into tears, right? That was a moral injury, and he should have felt that, and then we had peace and reconciliation, it was all kumbaya, it was all good. Um, <laughs> The problem with Niebuhr is that he says, and the problem with a lot of our nation's war fighters is again because of this whole idea of the American Western, uh, Americans, even though we wouldn't say this necessarily out loud, um, I think we tend to believe that killing is wrong, full stop, but in war, in self-defense, et cetera, it's necessary. And we have this just sort of default assumption. I think that's what's buried in the Westerns. And if you read combat memoirs with this in mind, you will begin to find this locution in some form or another. Killing is wrong, but in war it is necessary. The problem with Niebuhr is that he makes the very business of war fighting morally injurious, because killing is always morally wrong, but in war it's necessary. Well, you've just said that the, you know, you've, we've set our nation's war fighters up for, for horrors, and that's just unnecessary. So that's my big beef with Niebuhr. Hello again, uh, Andrew Davenport. So one of like the key themes of your discussion was kind of about the like 13 days, how can we prevent this in the future, you know, genocide in, of, of Nazi Germany. Um, but ultimately like the reason that the US entered the war wasn't even because of the genocide, it was mm -hmm. obviously because we were attacked by yeah. um, Japan. So obviously looking back with our 2020 vision on kind of World War II in that period, but also looking around at our current era and seeing that <clears throat> you know, current genocides that may be taking place, when is it just for uh, for us to, say, enter into a war? And had we not been attacked or provoked in World War II, um, kind of using the just war framework, when would it have been appropriate for us to get involved yeah, in, great. say, just genocide in that, that mm -hmm. situation? Mm -hmm. uh, let me handle the second part first, otherwise we'll forget about it. Um, World War II. Uh, I mean, I think we would have had just cause to enter in, um, you know, cer certainly, well, I mean, certainly when Churchill asked us to, um, but prior to that, I mean, uh, you know, what was it, uh, when in 1939, was it uh, May 1939, when he invaded Poland, certainly then, um, that's a good time. Um, I, think it, I think it would have been a just war principle earlier on to flex our, mu I mean, I, you know, I don't know, how much muscle America had to flex then uh, that would have been, that would have had a deterring quality to it. Uh, but I think we could have done all sorts of things to signal our intention to fight earlier on. That might have helped stay, probably wouldn't have, most certainly wouldn't have, but helped stay, you know, Hitler's belligerence and Japanese belligerence. Um, so I think a, a part of this idea of accumulating as much power as we can includes um, that power being credible, incredible in the sense that the world will believe we'll use it, right? So it's not credible, for instance, for us to have um, large-scale, you know, city-busting nuclear weapons anymore. Nobody really thinks we're ever gonna use those. Maybe in a retaliatory strike if our nation's burning, but maybe not even then. But if we have small tactical nukes, and, you know, we have forward presence, and we train with them, and we test them, and we do all the right things with them, all of a sudden they might become a deterring effect because nations will see that we have weapons that we're not just willing to use, we're, we're, 
were capable of using them. Could we have done something earlier on to help deter Herr Hitler and Japanese belligerents? I don't know. Um, but certainly earlier on, um, you know, we, we could have intervened uh, because we would have been rescuing allies, and I think that would be perfectly valid. Um, in terms of other interventions, you know, again, so one of the prudential concerns of just war is last resort, right, which says, you know, look, you should only use force in the last resort, which on the surface is clear and obvious. Like if, if I can stop you with a no, stop, and you do, then that should end things. Um, if maybe, you know, I have to ratchet that up, well, just ratchet that up until you've stopped. So last resort is, is obvious. But I think last, resource, last, last resort carries with it another implication, which is that there's some, some people want to make it a whole new category, but they call it use antebellum, so justice before war. And the idea there is just that, look, before we even reach a last resort, there's all sorts of things that we should be doing to try to make last resort as distant as possible. Um, an example that I like to use, I don't know if it's practicable, if anybody is an Africa expert, they would know better than me, uh, but did you see, so another good movie, Captain Phillips. Anybody see Captain Phillips, right? Another great film. So uh, quick summary, Somalia falls apart. Somali uh, military apparatus falls apart. The Somali Navy is now non-existent. The Somali Navy, therefore, cannot patrol its territorial waters. Therefore, Somali fishermen are being encroached upon by other nations' fishing fleets to the point where the Somali fishermen are pushed out. They can't fish anymore, so what do they do? They turn to piracy because they discover, oh, I don't need to catch a fish. I just need to catch your boat, and I can sell it for lots of money, and this is great, right? So, and then it gets to the point where they, hike, or they capture one of our ships, or at least a ship with an American captain on it. That arouses the ire of the U.S. military. We send a few Navy SEALs in there, do these extraordinary bobbing shots, and we take out the pirates. So it's a victory movie. It's a great celebration, but wonderful in the film is this sense of sadness on Captain Phillips' part as he interacts with some of the pirates and he realizes, he never says this, I think, in the course of the film, but like, dude, if I was you, I'd be a pirate too, right? Um, because I want to put milk on my table. So could we not have foreseen that something like that might happen? And could we not therefore have just sent an American destroyer into Somali waters and told everybody else, if you come in and try to take their fish, like, don't, right? So that, that's a way to forestall last resort, I think. And so there's all sorts of ways to intervene before we even need to intervene. Well, and we then, didn't see that common, I think. well, we didn't, but I'm not sure. At least now, moving forward, you know, there should be people who are focused on kindling situations where we can exercise just a little bit of common sense and think, I bet this might blow up, right? Um, that is asking for a degree of omniscience that is difficult to have. But why is America always thought to be the one to police? Right. Why can't somebody else? Great question. I think there's a couple of answers. One of them is we're always willing to. And so if you're willing to, like, why should I do anything, right? Um, I, you know, I can pay for child care in my nation. I can give, like, free, you know, baby Bjorns or whatever. It'll be great. I don't have to spend any money on my military. Um, I'm going to say something probably unpopular, but on this point, Trump was right, right? Other nations should contribute more to their defense. Um, I, and I also think that America should build up coalition partners in different regions and let regional partners handle regional issues until they can't and then we can step in. But it would have been great if there was an African coalition that was capable of seeing this themselves and saying, okay, we're going to patrol your waters and make sure that your fish are safe, right? So there's all sorts of options that we can employ to prevent us from having to be the ones who intervene. But does that answer your question in some way? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Mark, where are just war teaching and Christian realism at odds? Where is just, say that again. Just war teaching. And Christian realism yes. at odds. Are they ever at odds? Ooh. And if so, where? Hmm. Is this is a Niebuhr, question? Do you know? Well, I can well, only speculate. Niebuhr was not a just war tradition right. man. Right. Did you, did you hear my answer to Matt's question? Partially. Okay. Did you answer? Was it the same question? Ish. <laughs> oh, sorry. Ish. Matt, Matt only says ish. So, I mean, what, one of the places, it, one of the places, but it depends on your Christian realist. If Reinhold Niebuhr is a Christian realist, and he was... Um, his brand of realism, and I think, I think this is not just endemic to, to Niebuhr, but there is a brand of realism which says, and I, but, I, but I think this is particularly Lutheran. If there are any Lutherans in here, we can fight about this. But I think Lutheran moral theology lacks a particular nuance, and it's, and it's this, that 
I think Lutherans are more comfortable to say, here is the rule, but there are times we just have to violate the rule because there are other rules that we have to maintain. And in this particular context, these rules are more important or somehow supersede this one. And so I think a dimension of the realist would say, well, it would be ideal if we could keep all these rules. Realistically, we can't, so we'll violate these rules. Where my understanding of the classic just war tradition is that the classic just warrior would say, we're not violating any rule here. Um, we're asking how love manifests in this situation, and this is how. Right? I think that would be one way. Is that satisfying? Oh, always good to satisfy the boss. So. Um, hi, Ben Grasty. Um, so a lot of this is naturally framed in the context of America as a third party, as kind of history has played out over the years. But I can imagine a world in which America, not as a third party, but as the victim, that Christians would make the argument, and even you say this, <clears throat> you see this sometimes in our culture of war, which is a question in, of itself. Um, but if we're the victim in the war, let's say a foreign power, Russia, is like, we're going to attack America. I could see Christians making the argument, since we're the victim, we should use model Christ's character. And you've kind of alluded to this. When Christ was, um, when there's injustice against Christ, <clears throat> yep. he turned the other cheek Great. and bore the punishment. And there's emphasis of like his meekness, lowliness, mm -hmm. turn the other cheek. So I think it's easy to make the argument as a third party because he was the advocate right. for the innocent yep. and the people who are persecuted against. But what if we're the victim? Yep. How would you argue against or do you argue against a Christian who says we should be crucified or right. be willing to be crucified yep. like Christ was? Great question. Fantastic. Um, so I hope you appreciate the nuance of that, right? So it's one thing, so Paul Ramsey, another Christian realist, um, Protestant uh, Methodist theologian, Paul Ramsey uses the scenario of the Good Samaritan. And he says, like, it's one thing that the Good Samaritan, you know, comes upon the scene, there's the guy who's been waylaid, he's on the ground, fine, he picks him up, he, heal he takes him to be healed, all of that, fine. What if the Good Samaritan got there, as he says, while the assailants were still in their fell work, in the middle of their fell work, right? What should he do then? Um, should, he, should he stand aside and wait until they're done beating the guy and then step in and be the Good Samaritan in the parable? Should he intervene? Should he do something else? Okay, but that's still third party. Um, but one of the things he says there is that, you know, surely, maybe if I'm supposed to turn my cheek, Christ never meant that I'm supposed to pick up his cheek and turn it so that they can get the other one, right? So that's a third party scenario, that seems clear. Now, on the question of what, it, what about when it's my cheek, I don't know if you ever heard this, I actually heard somebody and they were dead serious about this, they said, well, you know, you figure if you're standing it against somebody and somebody smacks your cheek, well they smack your cheek and then you just get into a, like a boxing pose, now it's my other cheek that's been turned or something crazy like that, it was really manic. I don't think it's that. Um, I refer to C.S. Lewis on this, all right? So C.S. Lewis in maybe why I am not a pacifist, which is bizarrely like Niebuhr's, why the Christian church is not pacifist. So I don't know if um, Niebuhr was playing off Lewis or maybe, the, maybe vice versa. Um, but Lewis asks, what are we to make of that dominical utterance, as he puts it, when Christ says we're to you know, turn our other cheek? And Lewis's point is we're, we're we, we have to be careful if we say take that literally because like Christ said all sorts of things that would be crazy if we took them literally, like the dead bury their dead, things like this, right? So, okay, all of that, fine. But he said, uh, all that said, how about we take them literally? Uh, but then we have to ask what's really going on there. And Lewis's assumption is that, you know, the smack on the cheek uh, is something like a petty insult. And insofar as I have suffered some sort of a petty offense and my indignation rouse, rises uh, and I want to retaliate, I should mortify that because, like, suck it down, right? Um, no big deal. Uh, you know, you can, you can say, um, what was, my daughter and I were watching something the other day and I wish I could remember what this was. Oh, we're watching... Um, this might seem like a bizarre aside, but uh, we're watching Ted Lasso. Have you guys seen Ted Lasso? So we're only like three episodes in, but there's the, you know, there's the really almost like Cruella DeVille soccer team owner, football team owner, uh, who it turns out is like a really hurting person 
who's, you know, as my 13-year-old daughter says, well, I think she's just acting out her anger in, in nasty ways, but I think she's really hurting. And I'm just going to like stick a fork in her. She's done, right? Um, we don't know how somebody's personal history interacts with their will to lead them to do all sorts of despicable things. And it seems to me that Christian empathy and compassion should at least extend so far as to say, if I was you, with whatever history it is you have, maybe I would do the same thing. Um, and insofar as this is just a petty slight, and I feel like my honor has been violated, and all my manhood wants to rise up and defend my honor, I, I'm going to let this slide. I'm going to swallow that, and I'm, I'm going to suffer the injustice. An important principle is to remember that mercy always costs somebody something, right? Um, so in that situation, I should suffer the costs of mercy and just swallow it down. That said, uh, Lewis says, as soon as you change the scenario, the mandate changes. So if you're smacking me to get to the people behind me, whatever Christ said about me no longer applies. And I, I realize that now gets into the third person. Um, so I, I, I guess to maintain the, the integrity of the question, if it's always only me and it's only a petty offense, mortify the desire for vengeance. Um, but if, it ever, if that ever widens and includes something other than just me, the rule changes. Also, if the degree of assault changes, maybe the rule changes. So if the dude wants to run me through with a flagpole, um, maybe I should defend myself. And maybe in part because I'm a dad who I have kids at home and they depend on me, uh, I should defend myself because in defending me, I'm defending them, right? And that doesn't mean that you single guys, you know, you're out of luck. That's not what I mean. Um, future children, right? Um, you know, the scenarios are complex. Um, and I think when we can, even as a nation, um, absorb a petty offense and it ends there, we can absorb that petty offense. Um, if we think absorbing a petty offense um, what encourages an adversary toward greater offenses, we have to take that on board. And so maybe the scenario changes, right? Um, one of the nice things about accumulating a lot of power is we could absorb a lot of offense without being too bothered. And so maybe another reason to absorb, uh, develop capacity is to be able to give a lot of mercy. Is that satisfying? Awesome. We have one final question. Ooh, is it you? All right. That's okay. She's laughing. I don't know if it's okay. No, no. I, I, uh, I'm Shannon Walsh. Um, I, I always write my questions down because I get up here and I, I get nervous. Me too. Um, <laughs> so uh, you touched on this a bit in your last answer, but I'm curious how you think the Christian realist balances pragmatism with justice within the framework of like this loving the other. I'm thinking specifically recently of Biden fist bumping MBS and people kind of thinking, you know, yeah. Are you turning your back on human rights, but at the same time, the U.S. needs oil? So how do you balance those <laughs> two things? Well, you get on the phone, you call Texas, and you say, um, <laughs> but that's not the spirit of your question. Uh, so <laughs> forget everything else you should do. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, let's, let's cast it this way. The U.S. needs Saudi Arabia as an ally, right? Um, that's a fact. If you don't like it, you know, suck it up, buttercup, right? As my wife would say, too often. Um, that's, a, that's a sad, grim reality, I think. And if we're not going to be their ally, then they'll find an ally somewhere else. Um, and that would be bad. So we have to be their ally. Now, that said, um, yeah, I think the fist bump is unfortunate. Like, I think, I think you know, they, they tried to spin it and say, well, you saw the fist bump, but you didn't see what we did in private. And that might be true. Um, he should, you know... He, again, I mean, I, I don't want to make too much out of it because, you know, who knows? You know, the Republican president might have, you know, chest bumped him or something. <laughs> Could have been worse. Um, so, you know, we have to maintain the allyship, the alliance. Uh, and, but, but, like, if, if at the end of 100 years of alliance with the United States, Saudi Arabia hasn't changed one iota, there is something wrong with our alliance, Right. Um, so we should find those opportunities whenever we can to push against what they do. And when they apparently, I don't know if it was a kidnap, but when they you know, murder and dismember a U.S. citizen, 
um, there should be a noticeable response to that, that I trust, given that they need our relationship maybe as much as we need the relationship, uh, we could have done something more. And, you know, m maybe the optics would have been awkward, but he could have, you know, withheld the fist bump. I don't know, right? But I also know that, you know, these are hopeless situations, and there's nothing he could have done that I think would have been right. I mean, we, we, we were angry at him for going there in the first place because he should have made the phone call to Texas, right? But so th these are the realist bits where, you know, the, the, the realist is committed to, to uh, eating a lot of distasteful things because sometimes the world demands it. So how would you answer that, Matt? Can I ask you? You've got some experience. No, I, I think it's, yeah. I think you got the right answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that's it. If that's satisfying, that's satisfying. All right, he's in. Good. Matt, Matt, Matt is our ideological minority, so he's our sort of, what's that? Sounding board. Sounding yeah. board. He's our sounding board. So our affirmative action baby. So right there. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mark Livecki, for your very insightful instruction on Christian realism this evening. And thanks to all of you for attending and being a wonderful audience. I hope you will join us next Monday with Eric Patterson, part two, and bring your friends, and we'll surprise you with our meal selection. Until then, bye. Thanks, guys.